Yo, yo, welcome to the show, it's the number one show Interviews and music, podcast you know Integrate the culture through the times Just sit back and chill, it's the roots and rhymes Roots and rhymes, roots and rhymes Just sit back and chill, it's the roots and rhymes All you really need is some roots and rhymes Roots and rhymes, roots and rhymes So thanks for tuning in for episode two of the Roots and Rhymes podcast We're still in lockdown, but on a more positive note I'm joined by my co-host, Mac What's happening, Chance? How's it going? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. How's your week been? It's been good. It's been, you know, lockdown's challenging at times, just trying to keep busy, trying to keep active, but, you know, really looking forward to episode two. This one has been one of those highlights on my calendar that I've been like, okay, a few more days and we've got this going on because this is a big one. You know what? I'm really buzzed about this episode. Really, really buzzed. The conversation was great. It flowed so well. It was great getting an insight and... The guest today, I've been following for a really, really long time. And yeah. she's been in the scene for absolutely ages. And she's been successful throughout it. And she's doing big, big things. And I can't wait to for the listeners to, to hear it. For sure. I mean, when you talk about, you know, pioneers and trailblazers and people who have just ripped the scene open and done it their way, she's a, such an amazing example of that. And to hear her story, to hear her tell it, it's just, it's a great experience for us, but the listeners are going to love this. You know, and it's so diverse as well. It's, yeah. it's not just uh, one, one track minded, this is what I did and I kind of plodded along and did it. It's, it runs in so many different directions. Yeah. It's so interesting as well. Um, but you know what? We can carry on talking about it. Let's get to it. Let's do it. Roots and Rhymes. So Mac, I'm really looking forward to today's guest. Um, I'm, I've been following her for a really, really long time. Like when she was doing her Friday night shows on Asian Network and a little bit before that as well. Um, I don't know uh, if you're looking forward to it as well. I'm, I'm really looking forward to this one. This is, when you told me who we've got on, I was like, both me and you have been following her for a long time. We know her career. It was like, for real, like we got so-and-so on. You're like, yep. And I was like, I can't wait for this. It's going to be a great show. I'm really looking forward to hearing the insights, the information, the journey and everything Roots and Rams related. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? Maybe it's because she's the kind of DJ that I've always wanted to be. <laughs> that may, that maybe why I'm looking forward to it. I've always wanted to MC4. So <laughs> it makes two of us. Right. So let's not waste any more time. It's my pleasure to welcome today's guest. Growing up on the streets of Croydon, she's been a top draw London DJ since she was a teenager. Some would call her the Tim Westwood of the BBC Asia Network. She mixes it up with A-listers and has even impressed the likes of DJ Jazzy Jeff. But she's given her passport away and now she's living across the pond. It's none other than Caper. How are you doing? Hey. Hi. <laughs> That's a nice intro. I, I wasn't sure if you even knew who I was. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. I, I didn't just uh, send emails out and hope. It was carefully targeted. <laughs> Nice. But yeah, some would call you the Tim Westwood of the BBC Asia Network. How do you feel about that? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> uh, I guess it's a compliment. He's a lot louder than me. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. So how are you doing anyway? You're, so you're living out in New York now? Yeah, I live in Brooklyn. I moved here like, what was it, 2016. Okay. So been here ever since. I'm a green card holder. You know. <laughs> so Trump's got nothing to worry about there, has he? No, no. <laughs> Although it did take me two years to get my green card because Trump became president the year that I moved. So. Ah, great timing. Yeah. That's top yeah. timing. Yeah. So, so you're living out in Brooklyn? Yeah, I live That's in Brooklyn. That's pretty cool now, isn't it? It's kind of like the, the Shoreditch East London of, uh, of New York, really, isn't it? Yeah. Well, actually, I live in Williamsburg, which is literally, it's just, it's just new, like, the city is just over the bridge. Yeah. Yeah. So, so how's uh, things over there with the lockdown and stuff? Oh, it's been, it's been interesting. Mm. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's crazy because what is it? It's probably been two and a half months now. And, um, the, the last thing that I did before lockdown was I was in Chicago and then I came home and then I was supposed to go to Austin the next day for for a festival called South by Southwest oh, and wicked. yeah and then and and I was you know it's like one of my favorite things to do like mm. one of my favorite festivals 
and then just overnight it's just like bang everything yeah. is <laughs> that, yeah you know it's it's nuts because um i was out in chicago earlier this year and yeah. Even though you knew about this thing happening, it was it was like nobody was really talking about. It. Everything was cool and yeah. and just plodding along. And then I went out to Dubai and I came back and it was like, don't leave your house now. Yes, it's it's crazy. It's you know like we've we, I uh, I had um, what did I have? I had swine flu when that was going around and yeah. like, you know and I thought oh you know it would just be like that and it would you know just I a really never, bad never, flu. Yeah, I never thought that it would be a situation where the whole world is going to get locked mm. down. Ridiculous. You know, everybody's got, we, we spoke about it on the last show, everybody's got to use technology now and find these new ways to kind of be innovative. And I know you've got a, a massive presence on, uh, on Instagram and you do your Insta live shows, which I, I did catch this weekend, but you had a little bit of trouble, didn't you? Yeah, it was the first week. So like for the first seven weeks that I was, I was doing these lives, I wasn't getting shut down. So I was like, well... It, you know that's that's pretty cool so i continued doing it um and then all of a sudden um i did hear like so i'm on a on a on a group chat with like everybody that goes to this thing at jazzy jeff's house and it's like every like legendary dj and or, and there Casual was name drop no no it's not no I don't, I'm, not, nah, I'm just kidding but you, you know and i and i was looking at the thread and everyone was like oh you know instagram is is done now like you know um you know there's people that i know with like thousands and thousands of followers who are still um getting shut down so yeah yeah it's 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 been it was it was pretty irritating um but you know i think i think twitch and mixcloud and you know these other platforms are so Is Twitch has skyrocketed now, hasn't it, because of this? Yeah. I know yeah. so many DJs that have moved from Insta uh, over, and even Facebook Live, which was dead a little yeah. while ago. But Twitch it's is fr- it's crazy now. It's frustrating, though, because the, one of the main reasons why I was doing stuff on Instagram Live was because all my followers are there. And then, you know, and it's one thing that, you know, we're having to, you know, you know I can't do any gigs. I can't go out and earn yeah. money. But then now I've got to like build followers in another platform and it's just, you know, it's not as easy as what people think, you know, it's not, no. like, it's not like I can just put a message out and tell everyone to follow me on Twitch and people will actually do it. You know yeah. I mean? yeah. We, we, so. we spoke of that that last week as well, didn't we, Matt? That it was kind of like we enjoyed DJing or emceeing and the difficult part of it was the grind of it and bringing in followers because obviously we're in a social media orientated uh, environment. Yeah. As well, if you haven't really got a following or you're not big enough to even need a following, it, you've really got to put in the grind and you've got to look for different ways and different platforms, don't you? So definitely, definitely a lot of work. I mean, it's uh, it's so competitive out there as well right now. Like you know, we did a dime a dozen for every every industry, everything that you can think of. There's you know thousands of people doing the same thing, so to differentiate right now is a real challenge. Yeah, definitely. Was- How are you finding? this whole transition to online because obviously for you performing in front of live crowds so often, mm. you know, pro- pro- part of the performance is the energy that you get from the crowd back. Yeah. What's it, what's it been like for you not being able to have that live feel? It just, it, um, it's kind of nostalgic for me because it reminds me of doing radio. Mm. So it's that same feeling again, like, it's the same feeling that I used to have when I was on radio and, and I had to like imagine a crowd in front of me or, yeah. or the only, the only way you could, and the only way you could do that is, you know, by interaction with, you know, people texting in and um, messaging me on Twitter at the time and stuff like that. Um, but now it's, yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah, I think, I think it reminds me of doing radio and because of, I had have that experience. I, I think, it's not been that bad for me anyway. But yeah, I do miss, I miss being out in a live environment. Rewind. Let's take it back. Know your roots. So it's well documented that you've been in the game for a pretty young age. Uh, but before all of that, how did you get into music? What were your influences growing up? What's your earliest memory? Yeah, so, I mean, I was always... Um, I was all, I was into music from a very young age. There was, there's people like when I used to go to school, there were people like my 
school friends or whatever that wouldn't know anything about music but I knew I had this wide knowledge of music that it was just basically came from what like watching the box on an, an MTV and you know just sitting there like recording all the videos yeah, and, yeah. um but yeah I, I've been I've, I kind of started really young I knew what I wanted to do from when I was about eight years old I think and one of the main reasons is be- is is because I have have like two cousins that were they would do they were DJs in the early 90s and then later built a roadshow um, uh, thing you know yeah so, um, so they they pretty much influenced me a lot um, with music and they 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 were like R&B hip-hop DJs so yeah. um, uh, that's where I think most of the influence came from so were you kind of like messing around on their turntables or and kind of picking out their records and just jamming with them? Yeah, I used to, firstly, before my cousin even had turntables, I remember he used to have two tape decks and yeah, two, yeah. I mean, he could play them together. So, so he, he was learning to mix uh, like that, you know, by Press, you know, quickly press, rewind press, pause yeah. then play yeah. that's 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 <laughs> a real that's a real skill i know i know vinyl dj's talking about that being a skill but cassette yeah. mixing that's another level and i always thought it was so fascinating so i used to sit there with him when i'm like you know seven eight years old and yeah. he would show me and i would try and do the same thing they so they you said they uh, had a road show um was that kind of so but they were r&b hip-hop so did they have did they bring an indian musical influence um to that or was it was it just a mobile DJs playing R and B hip hop at house parties? Uh, so, so when they were younger, um, uh, my cousin, my, my cousin was at Bradford Uni, oh, so big up they used to. Yeah. Up, <laughs> <laughs> so they used to do a lot of um, you know gigs up in that area, okay, in Manchester and stuff like that, and mm. and then you know they were they were called Trick and Treat, by the way. Um, and then um, later on, you know, after they finished uni or whatever, they decided to to build a roadshow and do weddings and stuff, yep. which is kind of like the natural progression. But um, I don't. I I think they were more more known as like R and B hip hop DJs, and then yeah. then the the Indian either play like you know banger and stuff like that hmm. when they start the wedding stuff. So, uh, but I never grew up on on banger or. Yeah, or Hollywood or or any of that. Um, I was pretty much straight up hip hop, dance music. So, so was there no real like Indian musical influence, or wasn't it, it wasn't even played in your house? Do you remember the tunes and nostalgic about them, that kind of thing? No, was it like I had no idea? No, I my I mean my mum my mum used to play Garba. Um, okay. Song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And and they, and my parents are actually like massive Bollywood fans but I I was never into I just it was almost like because they loved it so much that me and my brother would just be like oh no we don't we don't listen to <laughs> you, have to, you have to rebel you have to rebel <laughs> yeah. yeah so we would be like no we listen to, to hip-hop and naughty by nature and you know like stuff like that and just trying to be, be the opposite of, of them so I can't really say that I was influenced by any kind of Indian music but I did hear it I would yeah yeah wouldn't be able to tell you any names or <laughs> <laughs> similar to the conversation that we had uh, chance just about that exposure when you're younger you kind of naturally move towards the type of music that influences you even if your traditions and roots are elsewhere you kind of get your own taste for music as you're growing up yeah so so you you, you mentioned naughty by nature is that one of your earliest memories of the tunes that you used to listen to what what was if you if i had to say what was the first track you remember listening to or listening to on repeat? What what would you say it was? I don't know. That's a hard question. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember. But yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, I remember, I remember we used to listen to Bobby Brown a lot. I don't know. I, yeah. I, I remember the first record that I bought was a Bobby Brown record. It was a seven inch. Um, Which one was it? My Prerogative? I think it was My Prerogative, yeah. That's a good um, guess. Yeah, so great tune. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's probably my earliest memory. But then I, I don't know. I used to, like I said, because I was, uh, I was, I didn't have anything to do when I was a kid, and then I'd just be listening to the radio and 
um, and you know, watching the box and MTV, I, I, I knew so much music at yeah. such a young age. And I would actually tell my cousins about the new tunes that were out. So, you know, I'd tell them, oh, like Jodeci's got a new tune out. And they'd be like, really? Oh, cool. Let me, <laughs> let me check it out. <laughs> Cause you know, they were at uni and I had nothing else to do, but yeah, yeah. This is music. So yeah, I, ca I can't really remember what my earliest memory is probably like it was probably probably like Janet Jackson because I'm wearing a t-shirt. Oh, I see. Um, no, I do love a bit of Janet Jackson. I I remember that era as well with the box and and MTV and and then MTV bass came later on and it was a bit more R and B hip hop orientated and just yeah. listening to them back to back and sometimes they would have like features of just one artist and I used to record them like yeah. if it was Michael Jackson or that kind of thing. So you yeah. had every single Michael Jackson video on tape that you could play back to back. Yeah, yeah. I basically made video mixtapes because I would wait for like, sometimes I would call, uh, my mum and dad used to go nuts but, because, <laughs> you know, it was like five pound a call or whatever. <laughs> but I would like request videos and I'd just sit there and wait. And, <laughs> wait. <for it. laughs> and, and I would know exactly like, you know, because if, if I've seen the videos so many times, I would just know exactly when it's coming on in the first second and I'd run to the, to the video recorder and press record. And Boom. Yeah. It was just a proper nerd. Like Today's that. generation just don't know the struggle, do they? No, no, definitely Everything not. on demand, everything on demand. Yeah, I still have those tapes. I, d I didn't get rid of any of them. We still but have them in the loft. Do you still have a VHS? That's the question. You might Probably. have the tapes. <laughs> Probably. Probably. <laughs> Yeah, I think we do actually. I think my mum and dad still have have one. So, uh, so obviously you got into music through your cousins and you, jumping on their turntables and your knowledge of music, passing it to them. So, how old were you when you, you hit the club scene and you uh, you were DJing? Uh, was that just in London or did you kind of go national? So originally, um, how did it happen? Um, originally, my so my brother, who is seven years older than me, he was at uni with my cousins. And he was influenced. Well, he wanted to be a part of their crew or whatever. So mm. he decided that he wanted to be a DJ. Um, but he wasn't, he did, you know, to be a DJ, you've got to be committed, right? So he, he just liked the idea of it, but he yeah. didn't actually put in the work. Mm. And he ended up buying a turntable, just one Technics 1210. And he decided to buy a couple of records. Um, and then just lost interest. And then I would come home from school. So I was, what, well, by that point, I was, what, 11 or 10 or something, 10, 11 or whatever. And I would come home and, and while he was at uni or, or at school or college or whatever, I would, I would end up practicing on, on his decks. And I learned pretty quick because I used to play the drums at school. Okay. So like, I already had like an understanding of how to match beats and stuff so that part was kind of pretty easy for me um and then um yeah so I just did that for like a good couple of years until until I was like 15, 16 um when I could actually like go to a well I wasn't really allowed to go to a club <laughs> but but I was chaperoned by my brother yeah. actually, to my first gig and it was a gig in Croydon in the middle of a like this this roundabout and okay. they had a, a car park in the middle of a roundabout in Croydon and this club was just it was it was a proper dive it was in the middle of this this little complex thing um and that's pretty much how I started I, yeah so my first actual live gig was when I was like 16 but I I'd, I'd already been DJing for so yeah. many years before that but just not in front of you know a live well, it's a long time to brush up your skills, isn't it? And, and get in front of the crowd. I mean, it was, it was funny because I used to go to, there was a, a record shop called Apple Records in Croydon. I used to go there with my school uniform on and to buy like, e either like, I could only afford like one vinyl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> either to buy vinyl or to buy like, um, like uh, DMC videos, you know. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I would go there and they would look at me like, what? They're, they're just, like, so confused. Like this little girl in a school uniform wants to buy scratching videos. What so so you, ne you wasn't just playing the music and like interested in playing out music. You, you're very much into that turntablist culture 
and yeah. watching DMC and probably watching the likes of like Premier and Yoda and that kind of stuff. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I always, how I learned to scratch was by using the line and uh, phono switch on yeah. a crappy little mixer that, I, that my brother had bought me for like 50 pounds. Um, that's how I learned to scratch. But I learned to scratch by listening to Jazzy Jeff. Um, uh, on the album, he's the DJ on the rapper. There's a yeah. uh, song in there called Live from Union Square. Mm. And um, it's just a live recording of, of Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff. And there's a part where um, I think Will says, show them, show them the Transformer scratch. And that's how I learned to scratch. So, and I was so young then. I'd, I was just like, what is that noise? So I'd press play and stop yeah. and tape, rewind and try and make that sound. And that's how I learned. So I was always into to scratching and and, and all of that from such a young age. I am literally the worst DJ in the world because I did not know that the Transformer scratch was invented by <laughs> Jazzy Jeff on that record. Pretty much, yeah. You're teaching yeah, me something yeah. today. It's funny because I remember I remember when he was on my radio show and I remember telling him that story for the first time. And it, and he was like, you know what's crazy is that that um he didn't they didn't know that anyone was recording someone just happened to press press record that day on that on the, at their show and it got put on the album and it's it's crazy because if maybe if that hadn't have happened would i have been into it as much you know would i've learned to scratch or work it's crazy to think about yeah that. that's so true that 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 particular moment uh that somebody plus record when they wasn't really supposed to as kind of as kind of a, a real defining moment in your career yeah, yeah and definitely. and started off yours that's that's amazing that is yeah yeah definitely that's that's exactly what, what he he was like wow i was like he he never even thought about it in that way kind of thing he just thought oh it's a live recording on yeah. like an album i mean obviously you've met him he's probably um as humble as pie uh about certain situations like that i mean yeah he, he's definitely one of one of the best djs in the world and i guess like you said to be um to be running in similar circles as him and stuff like that must be really rewarding especially in the early days um yeah, like saying, it's, de it's, it's definitely i still have to like, pinch myself sometimes you know i, I go to his house uh, he like he's made me tea and stuff <laughs> like and 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 it's just it's so weird because he's such a normal like humble guy and also a very generous person as well like him okay. and his family hmm. they always have people at the house and they he's always there's a thing that he does called the playlist retreat um where he invites like 50 djs and producers and stuff and when i say 50 DJs and producers this is like Questlove and like oh, Redman and like Vera Munch and and we're all basically at his house and he does it every year for like four days and it's kind of like a conference but it's mm. in his house yeah and he, he 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 always says that he never wants to do it outside of his house because it's more personal and yeah absolutely more inspirational to to be in his house and he's got a he's got a amazing recording studio in his house as well so you know he's just like he's he's very humble and very generous with his time so so, so would you say from that early age he's been one of your main influences then uh, through your career and is, is there any others that you you can recall um trying to mimic uh, like you say on the dmc videos and stuff yeah definitely like craze was one of them i remember i bought a vestax mixer a very expensive vestax mixer when I was like 18 because I uh, that I couldn't r afford by the way and I think I bought it with my student loan or something <laughs> that's a good use of a student that's a good loan. investment yeah yeah, yeah um, he you know he was he was one of them um, yeah I used to watch all the videos so like Rock Radar I was later on you know like in 2003 or something I was in a DJ crew with like a four deck DJ crew with um, DJ Pogo, um, DJ Scully, and DJ Two Seven Nine, and we used to um, we used to do this party called the Get Down at Bar Rumba in okay. Piccadilly Circus. Yeah. Um, and DJ Pogo was obviously he's he's you know like DMC 
yeah. champion and, and everything. And he used to, um, yeah, I used to go to his house. He used to, you know, teach me some things sometimes. And yeah. So you went through um, DJing when you were at uni and you talked about buying the, the Vastex mixer with your student loan. So was there any other club nights that you were doing while you were at uni? Because I heard from a certain somebody that you were a regular at Club Fez. Yeah, so um, so uh, there was a club. There's like four clubs in Cambridge, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. one of them, one of the one of the main ones was um, was a tiny, tiny little place. It was like 300 capacity, um, and it was called the Fez Club. And originally, I had been booked to just DJ there on Tuesdays a couple of times. And then um, I ended up taking over the whole night and then I created my own, my own kind of brand, I guess. And it took off and that's basically how I met a lot of my like heroes because I was like, all right, if I'm going to do my own night, how can I, how can I DJ with DJ Premier? How can I DJ yeah. with Cash Perverts? How can I DJ with Cash Money? And the only way that I could think to do it is if I booked them to DJ. So that's, that's how I basically met a lot of my, my heroes. And that's how I met Jazzy Jeff. By booking him. What's that? By, by, booking, by booking Jazzy Jeff. Yeah, that's how I met him. Right. In, in like 2003 or something. Well, uh, if it doesn't happen, make it happen, right? That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that, that's the thing. And that still applies even to this day, I think, to a lot of DJs who I get asked all the time, like, oh, how can I progress in my DJ career and how can I get noticed and stuff and I, I'm always like well you know if the, the best way to do it is to do it yourself right if yeah. you know don't wait to be um, noticed by this person or that person figure out a way to do it like make it happen um, and that was the uh, that was the most logical thing that I could think of so that's one of the reasons why I started the night and then it just ha it just happened to be successful um, it was kind of around the era of of like when crunk music became a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was a there wasn't that many um, there wasn't that that many places where you could go and hear it. And around the area of Cambridge, there were a lot of American air bases. Hmm. Um, so you would you would have like you know these guys and girls uh, coming from the American air bases to to my nights um, to listen to crunk music. So that's yeah and to listen to you know good music and it was just like a fun vibe you know yeah um, so, so that was um what like early early 20s 2001 early two? 2000s, 2003 because 2003 was quite a big year for you wasn't it in terms of accolades and and uh, achievements so you won the daily telegraph student dj of the year award yeah yeah yeah. as well as the Vastax Juice DJ competition, which is absolutely massive. Mm. The first yeah. female DJ as well. <laughs> yeah, um, that, was a, that was a funny story as well, because I actually, so I went, well, one of the main reasons why I went to uni was um, to, uh, to progress with my DJ career. I know it sounds like crazy, <laughs> but, um, because my mum and dad weren't, well, they weren't having it. So they yeah. were, you know, they, I was like, well, what do I do? The best thing to do is to move out and yeah. go to uni and not in London, somewhere outside of yeah. London. Yeah. And so I remember I made a mix. I did a mix on a mini disc. And I was like, I'm going to uni. I'm starting uni next week. And I did music tech at uni. So I, the first like week of my course, when my course started, um, I found like a third year student. And I was like, oh, I've, I made this mix. Um, would you be able to master it for me? Like, sort out the levels and stuff. And he was like, all right, cool. So then he did. And he And then he came back to me and he was like, who's, who, who did the mix? And I was like, well, me. And then he was like, who's scratching on there? I was like, me? And he was like, what? He was like, what? He, was, he just couldn't believe it. He was like, I'm in a, I'm in this competition um, and there's no more places left. But he was like, I'm going to drop out. And I think you should be in it. And I was like, what? I was like, I'm not doing that. No, not happening. And then actually that did end up happening. And I ended up being in the competition and I kept winning. 
I didn't think anything was going to come of it. And then I just kept winning, kept winning, kept winning all the heats. And then I won the whole thing. And then, yeah, and then, um, I mean, that was like, what, 2002 or three or something. So that's, that's pretty much how that kind of happened. Well, what an amazing, that, it's so amazing to hear these kind of moments in your life where it's been like, you know, Jazzy <laughs> Jeff recorded something and it kind of inspired you to take a journey. And yeah. the serendipity of this just, turning up and being placed in front of you it's almost like this you were guided to these moments yeah I mean I I can honestly tell you I I there's a lot of things in my life that I didn't plan to do yeah. <laughs> like I didn't plan to be on radio I didn't play all these things just kind of fell uh, into my lap in a weird way and then I just kind of went with it so I think I think sometimes the uh, situations like that have uh, a way of aligning themselves. Mm. I mean, I, I'm not sure what your what your attitudes like towards um, positivity and 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 that kind of thing. But I think, like you said, the like, like Mike just mentioned as well, these these moments seem to have came to you. And I, I don't I don't know if they 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 came on your lap, but I mean, obviously you've worked hard to to get where you are today and and like you say it it brought you into radio as well which it wasn't really planned either no that was definitely not planned um I was so shy when I was when I was younger I'm still shy but not as much but Mm. I couldn't even to to even put a microphone in my hand I would just like be like no no not not happening not happening right um so I, I couldn't even imagine like doing a radio show and that was another thing that where you know I was kind of around you know the sea I was in the scene of London and yeah kind of what getting known or whatever um and then one extra had called me in to do a pilot because they uh, they were just piling people and I was like all right fine I'll go um and I remember I took like a box of records and then tried to do a pilot with a box of records. it was just ridiculous um and then what ended up happening was because I had just started uni um, I was like, well, how would I even do this show? Like, you know, how would I do uni and the show? Because I'd have to come back to London and the show was like at two in the morning and stuff. Yeah. And, and it just didn't, it, I guess it, it, that didn't happen. Mm. And then all of a sudden I, my name was circulating in, I guess, around the BBC. And yeah. then I got asked to do another pilot and it happened to be the Asian network. And then, that's just how it's like literally just got asked to do uh, a pilot and that's so, so you dominated the Asian network for for around six years mm-hmm. I think you started on the Wednesday night shows first yeah. and then um you took that Friday night spot around yeah. what 2011 2012 yeah um so for somebody who's not really interested in indie music and you predominantly played like R&B hip-hop yeah. soul and and dancehall and and crunk like you did it at yeah. Fez Club, do you, yeah. do you feel it was because of the one extra thing? Did you also find it difficult to cross that boundary into mainstream media? That, and then this opportunity came with Asian Network because you were Asian, potentially. Yeah. So did you, you kind of just take that the scruff of the neck and it was like, right, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to jump on this. I just, I just thought, all right, look, I've been handed an opportunity. I might as well take it. Mm-hmm. But I was uncomfortable about the fact that it was Asian Network. And I was like, I don't really want to be on Asian Network because it doesn't yeah. really, I didn't think that it represented me. And I was into hip hop and I was, you know, that's, that's the music that I knew about. And then all of a sudden I'm getting asked to do a show on Asian Network and I had to, I had to learn about stuff from scratch, like it, like the Indian stuff. And I was, I was, like bang they used to make me play Bangra and I don't know anything about Bangra I'm not even Punjabi (laughs) I'm like expected to say all these like Punjabi names on on radio and I was was terrible yeah it was was like terrible it was so and I would even I even got to the point where I would purposely not say the names of the tracks and figure out a way to do a link without saying the name of the of of the track if it if it was a Bangra track (laughs) I was just so like embarrassed of the fact that I could I couldn't like say the the names properly Mm. um so yeah I was it was a it was a weird time but I just went with it I was just like all right well maybe if I did if I do Asian Network you know um 
one extra might ask me to do, which they did. Yeah. Uh, they then, you know, asked me to cover shows and stuff. But then I was like, mm, all right, that's fine. Maybe they'll ask me to do a show at some point or, yeah. you know, uh, maybe Radio 1 will ask me to do a show. It was, I've always had that hope. And then, but then what I, what I didn't realize is I was basically just getting put into this little box, box this little yeah. category. And then I got, I, I got asked to do a pilot for Radio 1. And I was like, what? I was like, yes. I was like, I'm, it's finally happening. And they didn't tell me what the, what the, uh, the pilot was for. And, I, and I, I prepped for it and everything. And this was in like probably like 2011 or something, yeah? Or 12, maybe. Um, and, it, and then I find out it was for another Asian show. So I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> you like find it difficult to kind of break out of that box then yeah because then now now all of a sudden i'm you know the just the brown chick yeah on the Asian network you know and i just i did i didn't think it was fair so no it's, I, it's, but it's interesting that you came from a point where you were never in that box mm -hmm. and then you got put into that box and then you had to break out of that box and for so many sort of asian indian artists they kind of start in the box and then try and break out of it but you yeah kind of went into the box and had to get back out of it, which that sounds so difficult to try and, you know, once you're in there to get back out of it again. Yeah, it was, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. I, I literally, I, after I left radio, man, I felt so free. I was like, wow. Like I was doing really well, like with DJing and stuff. And I was, I was, I was DJing in the States a lot. Um, and, and I just remember feeling like I could finally be like, me and not have to like pretend to like Bangra or pretend to like Bollywood or yeah. like or try and you know, pronounce people's names that you can't pronounce. pronounce <laughs> yeah, I could finally just be myself. Yeah, and but around the around the era that you was on Asian Network, it was kind of um, there was a resurgence of this Bangra R and B hip hop kind of vibe because you had like you had like Jay Sean and and Rishi Rich and Juggy D doing their thing around that time. And it probably fell right in to the era that you were in the Asian network. So did that kind of provide you a little bit of relief that there's some kind of decent R and B ethnic kind of vibe here that you could get on board with? Yeah, totally. Well, I would, I would spend ages looking for, for that kind of stuff. And there was, yeah. only, it was such a small scene. Yeah. That there's only so many tunes that I could, I could find, you know, and yeah. then actually Diplo, he helped me out a lot like he he um with his record label before diplo was this crazy massive edm dj yeah and he had his record label mad decent yeah. and you know he's he's very much into to indian cu culture and music he traveled there and he, he lived there for a while and stuff like that right so um a lot of the stuff that he was signing on his label was indian it was like you know influenced or whatever and but it was cool. So yeah. I was like, I was like <laughs> it was different. It sounded different. You know, it, there was also MIA and, you know, artists like that. Um, so he would send me like a folder of tunes all the time and save my life. Like every, <laughs> every other week. So, so that so was also like, around the time that it was, it was quite. Um, so I used to go to a night called Shanti in, uh, in Birmingham. Oh, yeah. um, and the likes of people like Asian Dub Foundation and stuff were really making a big hit around that, them days. What and that yeah, that was like two thousand six, yeah. two thousand seven. I especially well, that was around the time I was uh, rocking yeah. about in uni and into the DJing. So that, like you say, that's probably. Do you think that extended your career at the Asian Network because these were the kind of things that kind of kept you going? Yeah, if it wasn't if it wasn't for artists like Asian Dub Foundation. Um, that that kind of scene um i don't think i would have lasted there that long because they yeah. i was i remember in the beginning they would they would tell me okay you need to play more bangra in and i was like no i was yeah. like, I, I don't want to i don't want to play like pure bangra mixed with hip-hop i could i don't want to do that yeah and yeah when those when those artists kind of came around it was a it was definitely a lot easier to handle. so the, the you left the Asian network in what, 2012? Um, yeah. So 
it kind of feels like because a year a year or so later you released your your first tune right out of my mind yeah which is which is being streamed yeah it's an absolute banger. banger streamed over two and a half million times on spotify it's is a, it's something that sounds just as good now almost 10 years later so okay. great uses synths and drum patterns mm. absolutely love it but yeah. do you kind of feel as if leaving the asia network kind of like you said it allowed me to be free yeah. and your kind of coming out was was this tune it kind of brought all that out of you and you channeled it into into that song yeah because when i was on radio i couldn't I didn't have enough time to make music. One of the main things was, was you know, I went to uni and I studied music tech and I've, I've always wanted to make music. And that's the one thing, even, probably even before I was DJing, that's what I wanted to do. Mm. And um, I just, could, I, I kept getting distracted from doing the one thing that I wanted to do by all these little opportunities that kept coming my way. And, and doing radio was just taking up so much time um but i was actually like i so i started getting serious about producing probably a year or a year and a half before i left radio and um uh i just knew i knew, that was like my plan i knew once i leave asian network that's it like i'm not going into radio again i got offered to do some other other shows i got offered to do a youtube show I got offered to do all kinds of random stuff. And I, and for the first time I was like, not, not doing it. I'm making music. That's a bold move. That's a bold mm. move because it almost, that's again, is breaking out of your comfort zone, isn't it? Cause you were kind of, yes, you were put into this box, but a lot of people were like, you know what? I know it. I'm going to go with it. I can, I can go on this thing called YouTube, which was, probably in its quite early days before your influence who are gamers now that are getting like hundreds and thousands of, of yeah. subscribers. It, yeah, yeah. It, for some people, it might be the logical career move, but you saw it a different way. Yeah. I was just like, I can't keep being distracted by the one, by all these, you know, doing all these other things, you know? So that's why I, I chose to do. And also I want, I just wanted to, I wanted to just DJ as well. Yeah. without having to worry about doing preparing for a, a radio show or just having that thing in the back of my head like oh okay all right i got you know and i couldn't do that when i was on radio and i couldn't even go and do i would come here i would come to the states and do gigs but i would have to go back before my next radio show because they wouldn't allow me to have um you know time off and than, stuff yeah it was it was in my contract that i could only take a certain amount of yeah. shows off a year and stuff and i just i just felt so trapped like not being able to do the thing yeah I, th I think uh, i mean you you see i mean the bbc is a fantastic platform it's absolutely great but uh, you do see other djs i mean the likes of recently charlie sloth that have kind of moved away from the bbc and gone to beats one radio and and yeah. maybe because of the the same reasons but what what you what's apparent and what you've definitely seen is that your music taste has really evolved from what it was like in the beginning to, mm -hmm. to what it is now. I mean, listening to your Insta live shows and, and uh, checking out your videos on YouTube, you've kind of gone down this um, electronic house and funk and soul kind of route there. And I've said, I've seen a lot of great throwbacks on your sets as well. And you're mixing that up and, yes. and scratching that, that them is... in and developed your own style based on them. That's my roots, though. That's you asking me, right. you know, what what kind of music I grew up on, and and that was it. Like everything that I'm, I, I'm you're hearing me play, in, even in my my live streams or whenever I'm able to record a video, is that's the that's the stuff that I like. Mm. It's just you, you know. Sometimes you know when you do when you do gigs, even like when I do live shows, I can't play what I want to play. Some, you know, you have to. Yeah. Yeah cater for the crowd at some point you know there's a little bit of you know you know you, you can put in your influence here and there but ultimately when you're in a club you have to play music for the people that are in there absolutely Otherwise you're not going to get booked again so yeah you know the the great thing about what, me being able to do these live streams and stuff is like you're hearing you're finally hearing all the stuff that i grew up on that i like that must be so liberating to finally feel like you're in a position where number one, you can call your own shots in your career now because yeah. you've established yourself and you can really express your musical tastes 
to the public in a way that's unfiltered and unrestricted. Yeah, definitely. It is. So, so what sparked the move to New York then? I got married. <laughs> <laughs> the simple answer. Yeah. No, I was um, waiting for this amazing story about yeah, how no. <laughs> Jazzy Jeff recorded something one time and he just, all these things and he's like, I got married. <laughs> no, well, so when I, I, I guess I always knew that I would move here at some point. I couldn't see myself staying in the UK and being able to do any more than what I had done. Um, That's fair, yeah. And, you know, I was like, well, I've done radio, you know, DJed as many places as I could you know, what, what's next? And that's one of the reasons why I feel like, you know, things like so many opportunities have just come my way without me knowing is because I always ha have had the mentality to just keep going and think mm. like, be like, what's next? What's next? What's next? Yeah. Um, you know, so I, I, I guess I always knew that I, I would end up here eventually. Um, but you know, there's just so much more to do here. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, I mean, I, I love New York. I, I've been several times and yeah. I'll, I'll continue to go several times. But one thing that I found, the, the scene is, is so diverse. I mean, even in London, don't get me wrong, you've got something for everyone. But I think it's very easy for people in London, in my opinion, to be put into boxes. You're either this or you're that or you're that. And yeah. did you kind of feel when you were in London, you were this Asian or people would say this Apony female DJ and her name's Caper and she was Asian Network. So you're, that's you. And you couldn't really explore a different avenue. And th did it feel like you could be whoever you wanted to be in New York? No, I, th I think, I, think I, I, I did the same thing in, in, when I was living in London as well. Because I, I, I always, you have to understand that like the people that knew me from radio, just that, that's where they may have discovered me. But then mm. I also had this whole history behind me because I'd been DJing for so many years before that. Yeah. You know what I mean, so I didn't, I didn't ever feel like I was put into a box, but there was what, there was one, there was one point when I was on Asian network while I was doing the show that I felt like I was just, I could, I was only getting those gigs and I, yeah. I, I hated it. I was like, no, I, I don't want to do this. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, when I started doing all the, like the VIP kind of clubs and stuff. And when I started doing, bungalow eight and the box in london hmm. you know i was people just saw me as a dj they didn't see me that was i don't think i was put into any kind of category or box or whatever so, um, so how does the scene differ over in the states as opposed to over here i mean what 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 are the key differences what kind of music uh what, what kind of clubs are you in and do you ever play uk tunes over there and how how are they received yeah, I don't think that it's that they're as musically diverse here as we are in the UK. Okay, um, that's interesting. You know, being an open format DJ in the UK means that you know you're probably going to play drum and bass and house and like yeah. hip hop and yeah. this that, and all these different genres of garage or mm. you know um, that was what was uh, that was uh, that for me is what as being a web format DJ in the UK. Here is like, they're kind of just, it's just either hip, hip hop or house. And yeah. that's it. So I kind of, I, I feel like they're not as diverse as us. Um, but there are places where I can still play like, you know, like UK stuff. It's just, I'm not gonna, it's not gonna be the big commercial clubs, you know? No, yeah. no. So did you kind of have to adjust your game then? because of the clubs there and you kind of had to add to your, your your crates and and bring a different element into your game and is it is there certain clubs that you kind of think okay they just want to hear house tunes at 130 bpm back to back and yeah. then is there some of your favorite clubs that maybe you think you can explore a little bit and maybe scratch your heart out and uh, and play hip-hop tunes as well as anything else uh, it depends um I guess it just depends on the kind of gigs that you that I that I'm doing. Sometimes, like if I'm doing, you know, Vegas or like Marquee or or one of those kind of clubs, then I know that I'm only going to be able to play this kind of music. And then, you know, if I do a gig in Brooklyn, 
they're probably going to be more open-minded and I'm probably going to be able to play some good disco and yeah. like house and stuff like that. It just it really depends. Not one Pete. Not two Pete. It's the three Pete. So I asked you to choose three songs which you could play on repeat all day, every day. What is your three Pete? Um, <laughs> uh, LCD Sound System. Someone great. So, so what made you choose that one? Is there a particular point in your life where you kind of thought, you know what, uh, it, it brings some kind of nostalgia? Yeah, I think when I, um, when I started DJing, when, like we were just talking about when I started doing like more of the VIP kind of clubs and stuff in London, um, where I really had to like kind of broaden my musical knowledge. It couldn't just be hip hop or R&B and, you yeah. know, house or whatever um i was one of the main like artists that i would i would play was was lcd sound system um and i'm a massive fan of james murphy i just think he's a genius so i mean i, I have to admit something when uh, like when i first heard of lcd sound system i thought they were a drum and bass group their album sound of silver probably arguably their most popular album is a fantastic yeah. album it's um yeah and that, that tune's a great, great number one. So you could play that all day, every day. The bass line is just, it's just, it's, it's so sick. Like mm. it always, no matter where I play, it always sounds good. Yeah. No matter, whether it's in my house or in the club or wherever, you know. That's a um, sign of a great track, that, isn't it? Where it can kind of cross uh, okay. environments. So yeah. you, know, you play it in a club, it sounds amazing. You play it at home in your car, it still sounds great. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's a good real production, sign of, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Real sign of a great track. Yeah, it's it's very, and I also like uh, I um when um they did their last uh, concert at Madison Square Garden. It's on. It's they made a documentary out of it, and that was one of my favorite parts of the documentary when they perform it. Yeah. Um, and James Murphy is on this like amazing old school microphone mm. in Madison Square Garden. There's like a disco ball. It's like all the things that I love. Did yeah, <laughs> you ever see them play live? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. I, I actually saw James Murphy across the road. I can look at it right now. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he has a bar in Williamsburg. Um, oh, wow. Is that he why you moved there? Yeah, one of them. <laughs> <laughs> he has uh, this, this uh, club that just opened up just before um, lockdown happened, actually. And wow. it's like everything that you would imagine it would, a James Murphy bar would be. It's like yeah. you walk in and... It looks like a scene from like cocktail, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Cocktails and dreams. Yeah, where the, guy, where the guys get the glasses. Yeah. And stuff. Um and yeah, and it's all vinyl and turntables. It's like amazing. So yeah. Sounds uh, great. Yeah, he he had saw saw him in there like a couple couple of months ago, and I was freaking out a little. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what he does. He just walks around like Williamsburg because I think he lives there. So you see him. That's so time. cool. Crazy. Yeah. So what's your second? Talking heads. <laughs> once, in a, once in a lifetime. Um, again, I think it's just like, it's the baseline in that as well. You know what? I was just going to say for a tune that was like in the 80s, yeah. I think it was released in like 1980, the synth and the, the drums on that, it kind of sounds like the style of music like the 1975 or, or 21 Pilots are making now. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's such, yeah. like when when I when I heard that tune again, recently, I thought this this could be brand new. This could hit the charts mm -hmm. again now. Yeah, yeah, it's such a a great um, great song, um, and it's so distinctive. Like you just know when it starts, you just know because yeah. it's got that little like little bell thing. Yeah, yeah, uh, and it just yeah, it's just it's a great song. I can't really. <laughs> anyway. two um, solid solid picks so far i know so two solid picks and what's your third you gotta end on a high now okay i was gonna say one but i'm gonna change it um okay i was gonna say something uh but i'm gonna change it to janet jackson <laughs> 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 because um um which one though oh, it's really hard uh, that's a that's a tough call. Uh, it is a tough call. I think uh, it, it really is, especially for a, a Janet fan, and I'm a massive mm. Janet fan, so yeah. 
kind of hard, so maybe I shouldn't pick this. It hurt. <laughs> Uh, no, let's, let's, you got to commit. Yeah, you got to run with it. You got you got, you got to do this. Okay, what? Okay, my favorite song, I guess, from her would be "All Right," um, which is the one, the video where they're kind of in in the old fifties outfits. Oh yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Hats and it's all colorful and stuff. And um, yeah, I think "All Right." But then I love so many others. Um, <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, you get one right. switch. You get one change. Yeah. <laughs> just re- rewind that and do it again Janet Jackson's favourite tune is <laughs> alright Janet Jackson's favourite tune is Miss You Much because of the chair dance you know, the oh yeah dance. oh yeah yeah, yeah. Which was, I saw her do that live once really um, yeah was, like, that, was that in London when she was playing no this was when when I, I saw her um, do a concert in, in Atlanta and she had never done that live before, I believe, uh, unless she did it on the Rhythm Nation tour, but I was too young then, so I didn't see that. But um, yeah, I was like, is she going to do it? Is she going to do it? And I was, <laughs> I was in, the, in the front row as well, right in the middle. Yeah. And she literally, she did it in front of my face and I was like, wow, that is so hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> in sync yeah. with all the other dancers, is, that's insane. She um, was great. She had good genes when it came to dancing though. Especially oh, yeah, with definitely. all them videos with Michael Jackson as well. It's, it's yeah. insane with Janet Jackson because, I mean, she's such a pioneer, so talented. Mm-hmm. But she's just got a brother called Michael Jackson who is just yeah. exceptionally yeah, talented. It's, it's, and yeah, so that's... she kind of is like, in a weird way, underrated for how much of an entertainer she is. Would you I agree with that? Yeah. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of it has to do with her being a woman as well. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, but if you think about it, like, like I feel like women, it's hard for people to give women credit, mm. you know, um, and she deserves all the credit because there's been so many artists that have come around after her that have been yeah. influenced by, you know, if you look at Rihanna, if you look at mm. Beyonce and Britney Spears, even, yeah. um, uh, even NSYNC, like all these guys, yeah. they were all influenced by stuff that she's done before. Yeah. I mean, just looking at your T-shirt, just that pose, it's like, it's female power, that pose, isn't it? And it just like, you know, the, like you say, the Beyonce's, the Rihanna's. That's Still mimicking you can that, see that You can yeah. see where they've taken that influence from because she oh, yeah. really pushed that from the start. Yeah, there's so many things that I've seen Beyonce do. I've seen her quite live quite a few times as, as well. And I know that Janet's done that before because yeah. I've seen it. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and yeah. you also forget how, how long her career actually spanned as well, mm. because you've got the early stuff, yeah, but then she really hit that R&B phase as yeah. well. And she, she was a, a powerhouse in that as well. But yeah. people tend to forget that, that late 90s R&B mm-hmm. and how big she was. Because if you listen to curated playlists on, on streaming platforms, mm-hmm. you're not going to see a lot of Janet Jackson. No, no. Crazy. You, you do. You see your your ushers and you see your puff daddies and that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. But you yeah. don't tend to see the Janet Jackson as much. So yeah, she, she had a lot of tunes. Like, yeah. Sure. Um, but you know, there was actually a one. There was one point where I do believe um, that she was um, that she was more popular than Michael Jackson because if you think about the early nineties, mm. um, like in nineteen ninety three she was the biggest female star on the planet. Yeah. Like yeah. she was the Rihanna of the, well, in the early nineties, yeah. mm. say, right. Um, and, uh, and then Michael at that time was, you know, going through all the, the allegations and yeah. all the stuff, the child molesting stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I feel, feel like, you know, she was probably doing way better. She was and the she, popular, she wasn't a, popular Jackson at that time. She wasn't. Yeah, she wasn't she was, afraid of being controversial as well, was she? By the way she dressed and yeah. the way she was. I mean, even more recently at the Super Bowl um, halftime show. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, people would say it was it was planned. Who knows? <laughs> I don't believe it was. I believe it was an accident, obviously. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, no, she's. People don't understand. Like, there's there's some things that she she has said on her on her songs, you know, from the days of Rhythm Nation that still matter to this day. Yeah. Think, like, as well as her yeah. being, you know, kind of raunchy and controversial mm. in that way, she was controversial in a in a 
very political and socially conscious way as well and people a lot of people who don't pay attention to her and wonder why the hell I'm such a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one, of the, one of the main reasons is because she taught me so many things that I never would have known. Mm. You know? um, and no, I, I think that's a wise choice. I, I, think, I, think. I think it's a great switch and a great choice because of, like you say, it's, there's some artists out there that become more than their music. And you know, from a social, political sense, she yeah. definitely has transcended. And yeah. it's just a shame she doesn't, for me, get the recognition that she deserves as much as she could. Yeah, definitely. Um, so there we have it, guys. We have Capers 3P, LCD sound system, someone great, talking heads once in a lifetime, and we took a detour. And Janet Jackson, every single tune she's released. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just say Janet Jackson on a whole. <laughs> yeah. You know what I love about this 3P, chance yeah. The diversity of it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because... This, this just goes to show, I mean, the whole point of the podcast is that we're looking at Brit Asians that are basically diversified into popular culture and how their influences are completely different. Mm -hmm. And it's helped shape their careers. And, and um, that's why we, we love talking to you. But we should change it to 4 Pete and get her to give us a favorite Bhangra track. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, well, okay, so, so uh, all right. So I, I've, I've been kind of slagging off Bhangra all this time, right? but... <laughs> I have to say that I did, I did, after I learned about it, I did, I did like some of the tracks. A lot of them, like, so before, before I started the radio show, I'm sorry, I'm going to go off in one now. No, no, go for it. <laughs> before I started the show, um, before, after I did my pilot, there was a, uh, one of the head people from Asian Network came to my uni and bought me a box of Bungra records and okay. was like, uh, you need to learn about this. And he marked all the, the tracks, the popular tracks on each record. And mm -hmm. he was like, um, yeah, so can you do some research and just learn and stuff? And one of the, you know, one of the main, um, uh, one of the main records was, it was Punjabi MC, but mm -hmm. it was, um, what is it called? <laughs> you, can, okay. you can hum it and I'll, I'll, no. I'll try and guess. Oh, I think it was, it was Hoggy Asharabi. Did I say Hoggy that Asharabi, right? yeah, yeah. Hoggy Asharabi, yeah. So that, yeah. that was massive, that tune. That, that, that lasted many... People play it now and it still hits. Yeah, and, it's, and that is like a pure Bangra track, right? Yeah, and I, absolutely. I, and, you know, there's no hip-hop beats in there or nothing like that, which, you know, Punjabi MC obviously did a lot. And mm. that was like a pure bangle track. And I loved it. I used to, I used to play that at the Mellas all the time. I used to love it. The yeah. drum roll at the <laughs> beginning. I would like, but the yes. thing is about a lot of Punjabi MC tracks, they, they loop really well as well. And you can sample like the little thumbies in there at the beginning. Yeah. And they drop so well because they're, they're at similar BPMs than some really good like hip hop and R&B tunes. So they drop really well with them. Well, that's why, um, that's how I got away with, playing with not playing Bangra but playing it because I knew yeah. I had to play yeah. it so what I used to do was when I would do like my mashup mixes yeah for the, on the show mm. I would that's what I do I loop little little bits and then put other stuff over it and acapellas and stuff like that um that was my way of like it was my little way of getting over that little hurdle. this is the part of the show where we ask are you roots or rhymes Caper, the last question we're going to ask you today, are you roots or are you rhymes? I am rhymes. Do I don't you? know. This is a hard question. This is not <laughs> like, it's not like something that I could be. I think I'm both though. No? I think the interesting thing from this conversation <laughs> that I've taken is like, if we say like roots as in, are you Indian music roots? And that's where you came from then. Probably not, but well, you're, you're true to your own roots, which I think is really great about this whole conversation that we've had. Yeah, It's that's like what you've I been authentic from day one and yeah. stuck to what you've loved. That's, that's what I mean by when I say I'm both, because yeah. it's not like, what, is, what are my roots? Do my roots have to be like everyone else's roots? You know, right. I didn't, I, I'm from Croydon. I grew up in South London and I grew up listening to R&B, hip hop, reg groove, like, yeah. you know all the stuff that you hear me play in my lives that's that for me is my roots mm. whether it i sound like a coconut or not do you know what i mean i don't care 
<laughs> so absolutely like, you know what this coconut theme is going to come back because yeah. we were having this discussion last week because i'm week, yeah. i i was i'm the same really not really influenced by indian music growing up got called the coconut because i just used to listen to r&b and hip-hop anyway yeah. and it's it is that weird when you're young you don't really understand it but as you get older you're like those are my roots just because they're not the same as yours don't make them any less valid as yeah. roots yeah definitely. so there we have it guys caper is both not <laughs> Not roots, not rhymes. She is both. She's the and in the middle of roots and rhymes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so tell the guys what you've got going on. This is your opportunity to plug any of your future shows or anything you're working on at the moment. This is your opportunity. Well, I had so many plans and then COVID happened. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I guess, I mean, I don't know when the next, the next time I'll be DJing in a club, that's for sure. Um, yeah. But, you know, right now I'm just been working on learning how to live stream and about, all, you know, all this new technology that I have to learn. Um, and then on top of that, I've, I've, you know, I have all this time to make music. So um, I, I, I can't tell you if I'm going to put any more music out this year. Or I don't know. I'm, I'm just kind of going with the flow because I had all these plans and now I'm, and they're all shut down. So... <laughs> Well, what we do know is whatever you're going to put out, it's going to be great. And if you're not already, um, follow Caper. What's your Insta handle? Um, my Instagram is at Caper Official. Um, at Caper Official. Get listening to Insta Lives and recently Twitch. But yeah, watch my, my Twitch for my live streams. And also Mixcloud as well. Because now Mixcloud have a live streaming thing going on so yeah <laughs> wicked it's been a pleasure having you on the show today Kepa. it's been a great conversation and, and when i say that i've really enjoyed it i really have and time has absolutely flown so thank you very much for being on the show thanks for having me